I hope you're all staying healthy and as much as possible limiting limiting travel. Um, so with our, our notes, we want to contrast the idea of a census from a, a sample. And to this point, let's think about uh, what our goal is in statistical reasoning is we have some sort of a population of interest population of interest and I'm gonna draw on the sample reading that we did on uh, police agencies in the American West and I'll show you where I got that link um, here in case you didn't get a chance to pull those down um, so I should have my screen uh, visible here. Um, I did a quick refresh of the quick of the schedule, so make sure you did an F five here if you loaded it after, um, if you loaded it before about quarter till. And so uh, on the tenth, I gave you links to these two articles from the American Public Health Journal, which is a great little journal. Um, unfortunately, you will need to be signed in as CCAC students to get the full text. Um, but I'd like to use this as a, a sample so that we're talking about concrete things. Um, so I want to take a look at this, uh, this concept of law enforcement agencies' perceptions and benefits of barriers to temporary firearm storage to prevent suicide. So... Um, With that shared, I'm going to stop my share here and back to that. Um, so as, as data scientists, we are almost always attempting to figure out something about a population of interest. And we define four members of that population. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, we are we define a variable of interest that we would like to measure about the overall population. And so that variable of interest, I'm not good with my writing on this board. Um, the, one, of the, the, one of the questions that was asked in the survey of the police agencies was they're interested in understanding their if we look at some of the questions that they asked, well, the theory that they're working with is that folks are more likely to attempt suicide if they have access to a device to do it, um, and that would be a gun. Uh, more than half of suicides in America are committed with a firearm, and uh, we are interested in... Uh, hold on one sec. Uh, do not provide... And so, uh, let me show the screen again. I have, I literally have a dozen different tools open for this process. Share desktop one. Come back, come back. Okay, so I'm looking at the, uh, let me pull up actually the PDF, that would be better. Great, um, and so this is, this is neat because the structure of their data table is almost identical to the way we did the slicer surveys. So they sent out invitations for agencies in these American West states to complete the survey and then they sliced by agencies that do provide temporary storage so this would be a invitation I think there, there are several different mechanisms by which the temporary storage exists uh, some of which are um, I believe voluntary and some of which can be required based on people's interaction either with law enforcement or the mental health system. And so those, all of the respondents were sliced based on whether or not they currently have a storage program and those that do not provide that temporary storage. So we've seen this 
um, this structure uh, before and uh, the common way of doing analysis. So let's take a look at uh, each one of these rows could be considered a variable about the population members that we're interested in. So uh, individual, what, what would be the sampled uh, individual in this, in this study? That would have been the, wouldn't that have been the police chiefs and sheriffs that filled out the survey? Yep. And uh, it would be, uh, from what I did in the reading is the, um, where this is an interesting situation where if uh, it's probably the case that they only sent out one survey device to each agency and I wonder, I don't remember if we actually know who filled out the survey. Um, you could imagine that a, uh, depending on someone's relationship to the agency, they might actually answer some more subjective questions uh, quite differently, like this one, um, community perceptions and uh, relationships. So do, the question would be, is this, program a chance to be seen as a positive member of a community. Uh, you can imagine that you might have differing answers based on who you ask, but for our, our purposes here, the sampled individual is an agency, a, an entire police agency. And so we're interested in understanding how do all police agencies, the population would be all police agencies in the American West, so in these states. And our challenge is it's almost impossible and almost always cost and logistically infeasible to get information about each and every one. And so we are relegated to, uh, sometimes with more and less benefit, to only sampling a, or only getting information about a subset of those particular individuals in the population that we want to know something about. So if these are each agencies, we are interested in the uh, overall population characteristic of what is the average perception of the temporary storage programs for all police agencies in the American West. So our population of interest would be agencies, police, agencies in American West. And so uh, the convention would be that we, we think about the one question that we're, we'll focus on might be, um, what's a good one to, opportunity to help improve safety in the community. Uh, so we might at, uh, wonder what is the, true, in this case we'll use the, the Greek letter mu, what is the actual population average of uh, the degree to which the temporary firearm storage program is seen as an opportunity to improve community safety? So what is the true or the population average uh, of, uh, we'll say, temporary firearm storage improves uh, community safety. And so if we had the ability to ask each and every one of our agencies about their perception or, or their, the reasons for creating the program, we could in fact deduce mu, the true population average. But unfortunately, uh, we aren't able to get data on all of those individuals. So what we're gonna do is we will estimate the true population average with a sample statistic, which in our case, uh, and in the case of most statistics mathematical notations, we'll use x to represent the sampled or uh, in our case we'll say estimated uh, uh, 
the sample estimated mean for our particular variable of interest, which is, are you undertaking this program to improve community safety? Um, my notes are a little bit scrambled here because of our, our, um, our format. So the contrast here is we are doing a sample. So we are gathering data about a subset of individuals in our population versus, I guess we can actually put that in the notes. So a, a sample process involves gathering data about only a subset versus a census is um, all members, all, uh, boy, I'm feeling a little flustered here. All members of the population. And this is costly. It's Derek. This is Paul. Yes, Paul. I have a question. Yep. I remember you saying last time about census versus sampling. Yep. And I have a question. Sorry for the sorry for the noise, it's my son. Um, I remember you saying um, about, uh, like you saying right now, about the sample needs to be a subset of the entire population. In this, in this situation, what will be the criteria for the representativity of the population that we are sampling? Um, for in, in uh, the criteria for representation, uh, first and foremost should be random selection from a complete enumeration of everyone in the population. So um, that's a, that brings us to how do we go about getting that subset? And we can actually put that in our notes here. So uh, subset, and I'll say uh, selected through random, choice. And I'm going to draw a little picture. Our goal of randomness is to uh, remove the human bias in selection. So when possible, we want to use some sort of mechanical means for randomly selecting through random choice, which one of those individuals should be uh, chosen. So in uh, in the case of most surveys, once we have identified who our population of interest is, as long as we can acquire the contact means for each member of that population, what usually ends up happening is everyone gets, everyone gets a chance to participate, and we are making a statistical argument that the reasons for non-participation hopefully are random or at best or at best they the reasons for non participation do not correlate too closely with the thing that we're studying so in the case of our law enforcement agencies participation uh, they achieved a 78 percent of their 70 plus percent uh, response rate so their sampling rate of 70 plus percent was, was pretty good as far as surveys go, um, the danger would be if there was such a negative reaction to temporary firearm storage that the reasons for not responding uh, were uniformly because they hated these programs. If for some reason there, this was like a, a national mandate where uh, a you know, you can imagine if some sort of large federal grant was tied to law enforcement agencies implementing a temporary storage program, and those that didn't want to do that for reasons that we don't know because they didn't respond, um, they, uh, so they saw, oh, this is the subject of the survey, and they shredded it right away. So in that case, we would have uh, a bias in our selection, even though uh, we weren't picking and choosing individual members, it's their uh, response bias would have uh, emerged. And sometimes there's not a good way around that. Um, I wanted to post this because just today, I did this today in honor of our class tonight. Um, I, uh, 
completed the United States decennial census for my household. So this is an example of a case, a very unusual case. Uh, I hope, uh, you know, I should, probably shouldn't use that side of my car. They shouldn't let you do my census for me. But I'm going to flip it over because I'm going to post this online. I'd probably get in trouble. Um, <laughs> I'd probably get in trouble for posting my, uh, my response. So this is an example of the United States government um, not sampling anymore, but saying, we need as little error as possible, so we are going to attempt to ask every human where they live and some basic questions about their uh, na na nation of origin, language spoken at home, and, and several other key characteristics. Uh, age is another big one. Um, so this would be an important point in our comparison, which is the value of the census is that there is extremely low error because it's not an estimation. And so our goal of doing a sampling is that there is inherent error in our estimates that have to be quantitatively stated and computed. Um, so we have error inherent in our estimates and this means that when we are making a estimation of what the true population parameter is, uh, we, will, uh, we will have to include a statement of that error in our estimate. And that is coming through in uh, an idea of a, a confidence interval. So instead of saying, as we see in the article, that we actually believe uh, that there is a single true population value, the sampling process directs us to conduct or to create a, we might say would be a wiggle room factor around this population estimate. So we would say here that according to the sample, 75.5% of all agencies who currently have storage programs believe that this is a chance to be seen as a positive member of a community. But because not everyone responded, the, uh, based on the variation of the responses, we, a, a statistician would come and say, we believe that the true population value of 75 point, or the estimated population value is likely to land somewhere between 72 and 78 percent, um, but we don't know exactly where in that interval the true value actually lies. Um, and so tonight we're going to learn how to compute that conference interval, and that's related to the variation of the underlying responses by the agencies. Um, and so now we're ready to jump into our library sampling project. Um, any quick comments on, uh, on this uh, difference? So we would have like a, let me just finish these notes here, confidence interval. So we would say, this is, there's wiggle room. This is the wiggle room. We suggest the middle, what was that number I just put up on the screen? The point estimate was 75 point. Um, I think five. 75.5. Is the other was 78.8 and 73.2? Yep, 72.3, you're really close. 72.3 and 78.8. So that's a relatively narrow band, only uh, about, you know, about six percentage points uh, in, that, in that variation. And so what we'll learn is that this conference interval, we, the way we would state this is we would look at their results and they would almost always, it's very common in social sciences to state a 95% conference interval and we'll learn about that number is related to our normal curve 
the way we would say what this means is if we were to sample, if we were to conduct exactly the same experiment a hundred times, we believe that 95% of those hundred samples would yield a estimate of the true population mean between 72 and 78 percent. So the conference interval is a statement of, uh, of precision about our approach to researching this particular population of interest. It's not saying uh, 95 percent of all of our measurements are correct. It's saying if we were to repeat the same uh, sampling approach, we think that this range would capture the true population value uh, 19 out of 20 times, or 95 out of 100 times. Um, and uh, this magic number of 95% comes from our, our what? You can say it with a big, bold voice. The p-value? Um, it's related to the p-value. It comes from the shape of what? Uh, like normal distribution. Bell curves the other day. Yeah, the know. bell curve, exactly. Was that Penny and Tom? Yes. Thomas? Great, thanks for jumping in. Um, so I want to show you that I, I found what I think is a very, the Wikipedia had the best of the tools out there. And so if you jump all the way back to our homepage, I posted, in fact, I should post this link everywhere. Uh, if you go down to data analytics, um, right here, normal distribution scales is a link to the Wikipedia. Um, oh no, it did it again. Um, if you click normal distribution scales, the Wikipedia on conference intervals gives what I believe is a really, um, a solid value, a solid breakdown of the, of, of the Gaussian distribution or otherwise known as the normal curve. So notice that the 95% conference interval is saying that if each one of our samples is normally distributed around what would be the true population value in the center, a plus or minus two standard deviations will capture 95% of the area under this bell curve. Um, and we'll jump into stat key here and take a look at that right now. So let's, let's explore that by going to stat key. And you can get there a number of ways. I have links on it on our library sampling page. And on our homepage, and you can type in stat key into any archiving or non archiving search engine. And I think they have a nice, um, they have a nice uh, normal tool just sitting right here for us. Um, good. Okay, so let's um, let's have that open. I just want to tinker for a moment on uh, on what I mentioned about the sampling distribution. Actually, no. I feel like what's our time doing? Thirty-five. I think we need to jump into the, the library sampling. Um, so let me orient, let, let's get set up here on the library sampling. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, by the way, I got here with, here's tonight's link, and then uh, sampling mini projects will jump you to here. Um, I put a couple of buttons up here, learning resources. I, um, 
I posted a set of three core resources that we can use for analysis. The first is a reference to the Lock 5 textbook, if you have that, Chapter 3 on Conference Intervals. The, I also posted a video of the locks. I think we got a mama lock and a, and a daughter lock uh, discussing sampling uh, using their own tool for about an hour. Uh, and then I also posted a link to a textbook created around LibreOffice Calc for sampling and uh, statistics using calc. So as, as we go through this, remember we have those resources there. So let's, um, let's shift back to our idea with uh, the library sampling. And you'll find that, uh, unless, I guess most of you probably don't have your paper anymore, if you wanna go ahead and download the editable analysis guide, uh, that will allow you to type directly into our organizer. So go ahead and get that up. And then I would also ask that uh, you refresh that page and um, where did I put Google Drive? Okay, um, I forgot to do a save, so everyone refresh together at once. Ready, set, F5. Uh, and this link to the Google Drive uh, should pop right up, Class Project Tracker. So let's, um, let's take two or three minutes and get ourselves organized. And by organized, I mean uh, when you open up the tracker, Let's, I'll go ahead and if you remember your uh, call number prefixes for your two different uh, call number sections that you want to sample, I'm going to go ahead and do first names on all of our rows here so we don't click on that. So just give me a second to type your names in. I'm going to go in the order of the attendance. Uh, oops, sorry, Connie. I'm so glad you're all made it in. Yeah. Uh, this is AEL. And if you want to change the name that's up there, please do so, but at least you won't be conflicting with anyone's row. So remember in... Uh, Oh, let me not let me actually give you time. Uh, let's take a couple minutes, and then you want to get this uh, pulled up, which is your um, your tracker. Hey, Eric, where do we access this document again? This is under resources on our sampling page. So. Um, that would be from the schedule, sampling mini projects, and then resources, and then so sampling mini projects, uh, and sorry, mini project two, library sampling, editable analysis guide. Thank you. Yep. And then if you can go ahead and raise your digital hand when you are set to move on, that will give me a sense of where you are. It's hard because I think I can't see anything going on in your world except for a couple of people's faces. Again, please go ahead and raise your digital hand when you are set. I need to, I only have the, uh, 
I don't actually have the library code. I just got the names of what I ah. Okay, so back in the uh, on that uh, resource list, the last resource link is the classification okay. team. And so you'll want to select um, a two letter prefix. Uh, so choose your broad category and then the oh my goodness oh wait is that me no it would be close i thought that was my picture uh, so in my case i'm going to choose um my favorite section in the library in uh undergrad was hd which is uh, uh, labor. So it, I'm just doing the subclass. Yep, so just two letter prefix. Okay. Right. Okay. Oh, I'm an idiot. It's already written there. I didn't know what they were. Unfortunately, since we don't have physical books, we can't do the, the quality ratings. We'll probably do a, um, we'll have access to pages and uh, and year. I'll pull up the sample I got from, um, where'd you go? As long as you have a prefix, we can we can move on. Uh, you'll get a chance to. I'll have you do a little bit of practice sampling first, so you can see what's available. So don't worry about arriving at a uh, an inquiry question. Just make sure you have the editable document, so you can uh, you know where that is, uh, and then have the uh, spreadsheet up. Spreadsheet. So again, make sure you refreshed my yep. page, Thomas. I, I updated it while we were it, it it downloads, it doesn't open. And it's a non live version. It's just a document. Oh, you mean it doesn't open in a tab? It's not that you're having problems. No, it's not that I open it and it downloads to my computer, it downloads the form. I think that's a browser thing though. But you're not saying it doesn't, it does open in a word processor though, right? It opens in Libre. Or... Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, so it's not, it's right. not a shared document. It's yeah, just, okay, okay. just a document though. Yeah. Anyone having trouble finding stuff? Okay, make sure you've refreshed the uh, sampling page. And we're on mini project two, library book sampling. All right, let's see. Anarchism HX. That's it's got a good uh, it's got a good call number prefix. That's good. The zoology and nursing one. I remember that one was very interesting. Do you have a degree in economics, Grace? I do not, but recently what coronavirus does to our economy, I 
become very interested in economy. I want to understand yeah. how yeah. the economy reacts to, to these situations. Yeah, when I I, uh, I took a bunch of econ classes, I didn't, my degree was in anthropology, so I always stuck out like a sore thumb in econ classes. Like, wait, what is, there's, I don't, there's no sand and dirt here. I don't know why. Um, but it was, it was always interesting because with large macro econ, um, one of the major challenges with studying macro is that there's not enough big shifts so so there's not enough before and after stuff but the viruses unfortunately give you a clear sense of before this state it didn't exist and so you can make a lot of inference about how things react when you have a definitive point where something changed and that's the main challenge i heard i understand with um minimum wage laws is that they because minimum wages have been creeping up so slowly it's hard to infer their impact because there's so many other changes that happen along uh, the same time. Um, so change is, is helpful. Um, oh, good. And it's fun to see everything populate together. Um, so we've got, uh, oh, yeah, music versus general lit. That's great. And Joanne and Steve, are you having trouble finding the shared drive? Uh, yeah, I don't. I have that, and I don't have any of my materials from when we were going into the library. No, okay. I'm good. I just didn't oh. have any material to add in. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm looking. Great. <laughs> we're good. So can I? I, I guess I'll um, I'll move on with the what the tools I came up with for doing the sampling. So. Um, after a little bit of poking around, like I said, I did find us some search tools that will allow us to sample by call number. And so I found uh, Chris and I, librarian Chris and I found uh, Ohio Link and the College of William and Mary. Uh, Ohio Link loads significantly faster. Uh, and so I'm going to demonstrate with that. So when you get the Ohio Link, library catalog up you can it'll give you search options and then we can come here to call number and then we have three different call numbers different book sections have different call number prefix um, trees classification trees we're going to use the library of congress which is the standard and that's um, we can actually just put in the prefix. We don't even need wild cards on this one. So if I do HD and then I search, I get what looks like a, a pretty good, I get, I get 32,000 results, which you kind of expect from a major prefix for HD, which is, um, what's it officially classified as? Uh, industry, land use, and labor. So here, each of these is a book. And luckily, we're able to categorize it. Uh, we can access the books with a link. Now, what we don't know, because I, it uh, looks like what's, what's happening is we're getting call number in ascending call number order, uh, which is a... When I, when I do a little bit of searching, it, it does seem to somewhat correlate with year. So we're, we're experimenting with this digital, digital tool. Um, so what I'd like you to try is just try putting in your classification code and, and click on a couple of books and get a sense for what the entries look like. So we get the author title, we have a printing location and printer. We have holdings within the Ohio University system. 
Uh, it looks like we get a page count. So I'm uh, the 1026P is pages. Uh, this book size, um, I'd have to do some poking around to see where that came from. Um, I might see 23 centimeters, probably vertical height. Um, I'm wondering if it's either vertical or, or diagonal. It might be diagonal. Um, How did you get to that Ohio link site? That was, uh, it was, you would have to have refreshed our sampling mini projects. So refresh this and then mini project two sampling. And it's right here. Okay. Thank you. And so we're thinking about what the, what the variables could be for your sampling. Um, and so when I'm, I'm just doing some uh, exploratory sampling uh, to see what the different, I'm thinking this might be addition, eighth edition. You can do, you know, publication uh, continent could be an interesting one. Um, or subcontinent. And I'm the reason I chose the Ohio tool is that I like it because it allows you to easily uh, we'll have to choose a sampling approach where we're if you if you get thirty two thousand results, are other people getting thirty two thousand results? Is that a limit? Yes. Yeah, that's the limit. Great. So um, if we think about and remember the the rule of thumb for sample size ish all else without any other information how many might we want to sample if we're not planning on slicing it too much at least 15 yeah i said i said 15 in the library for time and remember what the general number would be double that 30 30 yeah and the reason for that is at uh at 30 degrees of freedom the students T distribution is almost identical to the normal distribution. So we stop, uh, we, we were transitioning from statistically what is thought of as small sample size to not small at, at about N equals 30. And so I suggested 15 so that we were sampling approximately 30 books uh, between two different call number sections. Um, so with roughly 32,000, uh, books, we are going to want to, to if we th think of our population then as 32,000 results returned in the Ohio University system. Um, does anyone uh, want to try the uh, William and Mary? If they are, uh, I did a, I just got that link from Chris a little while ago, so I haven't looked at that terribly carefully. Um, it'd be interesting to see how much sample, what sampling they give us. Oh, I got an error message. Let me make sure I did it right. Non-existent view. Oh, no. I tried that link a couple times. I was having a little bit of problems with them. Okay, well, let's, all, let's go with Ohio tonight. Um, I don't have time to debug that right now. So, if... We, what we want is to make sure that we are randomly grabbing from across that whole range of 30,000 books. Um, and so one of our, our goals is to not have some sort of underlying pattern in our selection that would bias our results in some way. So, um, what might be some drawbacks to just choosing every thousandth book? So I might be able to just come through. If you go to the bottom of the search page, you can jump to results by number. And so I can, I can type in uh, a number there. So if we just if we just went by thousands, um, 
to get roughly 30 samples and we chose the first book on each return page that's not a, a it's not a bad approach assuming that the results are being returned in some sort of uh, looks like it's in call number numeric order by the database and the actual call number itself does not seem to be following any deliberate pattern of the number of the call number doesn't seem to correlate very well with so if I go to six thousands I'm still in the HD 30s so as long as we're convinced that that correlation is not um, there's not some reason that the six thousandth result has something in common uh, like oh we put the oldest book in uh, in the thousand range at the beginning and then sort then if you were checking the publication year you would have a bias um, so one option would be is if we're getting 32,000 results um, we the we want to introduce some sense of randomness in how we're selecting these so um, we could just do a draw uh, of a random number generator between one and 32,000 and, um, and pick that. So if I were doing this for randomness, one way to do it is to grab a, a spreadsheet and ask it for a random number. And in this case, it's gonna give us a random number between zero and one. And what I can do is if I had my max value, my max return value of 32,000, I could just multiply each draw by my total. one oh trains I miss trains I live next to a shipping a major freight line in East Central Arkansas and had about 20 or 30 trains a day by my house it's very exciting um, so what this is doing now if I take this and grab 30 of those draws I would get uh, random search results that I could then come over here and I could punch those in down here. I could round these to a, a whole digit. So that's an option if you're a spreadsheet whiz. Um, another option that's simpler to introduce randomness might be to just do a random draw um, between one and say uh, 32, and then that becomes your hop size. So if you came and said, uh, you said uh, online, So I encourage you to experiment and think about how, how do you, where do you want to get your randomness? So if I said, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to have it choose me a hop between one, and I'm going to go a little bit over a thousand. Oh, this site is terrible with all the ads. Um, I can't deal with the ads. Um, random.org integer. That's cool. Um, generate a hundred random numbers. This one looks pretty cool. So if we say, I want to sample 30 books, Integer should have a value between 1 and 32,000 
format in one column. Let's see what it gets us. That would be a, a very acceptable way. Remember, as long as we're, uh, because we're already dealing with a, a value that is somewhat random, which would be, in our case, the call number, because we're not, we're not sampling the call number itself. We're sampling attributes of that underlying call number. Um, uh, there's a bunch of ways to roam around randomness. So this was that's our way that we remove our human our human touch from that selection process, which is our ultimate goal. So if I were, let me just make this bigger and get rid of these. Okay, so then that would, those would be my draws. So I'm, we'll take, um, let's see, it's 19. So we'll take, let's take till seven, let's do till 740. Um, we'll take till 740 on, let's see where we are. Uh, 701. Let's take till 740 and I'd like you to get yourself set up on your sampling and actually go ahead and uh, do your samples all on the Ohio system choosing, uh, I'm going to encourage you to choose two attributes if we all do page number uh, so that we have some form of comparison and then I think it might be interesting to try to find uh, some other piece, whether it's addition. Uh, it might be interesting to try to sample size and see what patterns we see there. Um, you know, you could do a bunch of different things. You could even do which, which section has more holdings in the Ohio system. So you could do a count of the number of, uh, of entries, the number of actual books held by Ohio, um, which would give you Perhaps it might give you a way to sample the overall interest or coverage of a section by the Ohio Library, uh, Ohio University Library System. So I want to review conceptually about our our two major divisions. So let's uh, I sampled HC, which is uh, labor, and organizational behavior. So HC by Library of Congress defines for us a population of individuals about which we are interested in our variable uh, mu, which is the populations, the total average page number of all books the Library of Congress has given the HC prefix to. And so I want us to think uh, this is on the population side, this in normal data analytics is always theoretical because we almost never have complete information about the population. But in thinking about computing conference intervals, we will, uh, I'm gonna simulate the theoretical population distribution. Oh, that was very, very uneven. Meaning, if we gather data about every single book in the Library of Congress's HC section, we could make a distribution in which, or a histogram, in which there is some sort of uh, and we'll assume because most populations have some sort of normal distribution that there would be a mean and in our case we can imagine the mean the true population mean mu uh, and I actually did I actually did a simulation here so I'm going to do some switching between uh, a graphic and the board because this is this is the critical explanation. So I, I actually, in our, for our purposes, we're gonna say I, I did this. Oh no, my, uh, 
Oh, can you see that okay on my, can you see my screen or did it die? Let's try it again. We're looking at the blackboard. It okay. came back. Now it's screen. Okay, excellent. So um, what I found was that the Library of Congress has in fact only 2,652 books with HC prefix. And when I sampled the entire population, I got a population mean of, we're gonna round to the nearest page, 592 pages, okay? So that is the true population value that in data land, we don't know. But in our, for learning cases, we did. So from the standpoint of data analytics, we are trying to create an estimate of this true population mean. We want to know something about this entire population of books. And remember, this could be something like, um, what, is the, um, what is the average level of white blood cell count in a population in California? So it could be any quantitative value of which knowing the center would be useful. Uh, and then most notably, we will be comparing the center of two different samples of two different populations, HC and then whatever other uh, uh, prefix you chose. So this is uh, mu, we wanna, in, in your notes, please do this with me, it'll be good for your brain. So this is the quote unquote true value. So is this an estimate? No, this is the true population value about which we are trying to make an estimate with the sample. So we are estimating, so we would say we are estimating mu, the population, with a sample statistic. And in our case, we did a single sample we selected 30 books from a total uh, N. So uh, I'm going to say N, what did, on my screen, I had a total N of 2652. Uh, N equals 2652. So if we take just uh, estimate with sample statistic of N equals 30, um, and we can, I'll show you on StatKey how we can play with this experimentally. So let's, uh, because checking each of the 2,652 books would be too costly or take too long, we're only going to select 30 and we're going to average that sample. So again, we are, um, we are talking about an estimate for the population average. So we're talking about an estimate of a, uh, of a statistic that is showing us the center uh, of a given group of numbers. So let's try that um, on, the, on our sample tool. So I'm gonna come here and say, uh, let's do, I'm gonna choose a sample size of 30 to draw from my population. And when I pull 30, I get a mean of 761. So did I, did I hit the actual population value? No, I was 700 and 61. So I need someone with the calculator ready because I want us to um, grab some differences. So how far off from the true population mean was I from 761? So what's 761 minus 592? 170? That's a guess. Don't put that down. 169. Good. Is that Penny? Yeah. Thanks, Penny. Okay, so uh, let's let's do it again. This time I got a mean of five hundred and sixty 
five. So how far off was I on my second sample? 27. How much? 27. So I was a little bit closer. You can see our pattern here. Let's do another sample. I got 559. And how far off was that? That wasn't too far. That was 33. 33. Um, now, let, this is taking a long time. How about let's do another 100? I just sampled another 100 times. Again, from that same population, I keep drawing a sample size of n. And each time I did a sample, this tool put a dot to represent the average of that individual pulling of, a, of 30 different books. So you're still seeing my screen here. So again, what are we noticing the shape to start becoming? Let's do another 100 samples. It's turning into a normal distribution. Yeah, so remember, is the population particularly normally distributed? Nope. It's a mound. Uh, it's not a mound. It's, it's, uh, we've got books kind of scattered all over, but it does have a center because every group has a center. And so if I keep sampling, what we have, what we're seeing on our screen is a sampling distribution. So this is a distribution of individual samples. In our case, what we just did over the last hour was we only did one of these. But what's interesting, look at where our means coming. When we did, when we sampled, how many do we have here? We have um, uh, 900 samples. What is the average of the averages? We are less than one page off. And so this is one, uh, this is, this would be expected if we are truly randomly pulling from this entire population, the center of all of our samples, some of them will be farther off than others, but they will coalesce. They will start to group around the true population value, which in this theoretical example, we know to be 591. So the fact that the average of all of our samples is extremely close is reassuring um, and would be expected if we were uh, truly randomly pulling uh, from this, uh, this, this population. So now what we, um, I'm gonna actually reset this plot and say, well, let's, if we do one sample, again, we had our 727.6 was our was our point estimate. I'm going to stop my share and let's, uh, let's jump into this. So we could, in theory, keep doing this a whole bunch of times like we did. We did it a, a thousand times. Um, but we want to use statistics and mathematics to make a reasonable estimate of our true population value of 592 pages with only my one sample. Now, because we're, for ex the, I was quite glad that this was significantly further off than my other random samples. That's how randomness works. Some are gonna be further than others. What our job now is to figure out how much, how do we state the, our level of uncertainty of our pop of our sampling estimate. So uh, we had our uh, the sampling I just did was 761. So if we think about it, I want to in stating the results of my study, I want to figure out how much wiggle room should I suggest or should I put around how much error is there in that popular, this is our, our point estimate 
of mu of our population parameter of the true population true population mean how much air should we put there in other words what we want to do is take x bar so this is uh this is our point estimate of the true population mean and we want to add and subtract some margin of error. So again, I call this wiggle room. What would be a reasonable value for this? That's what we want to figure out. And uh, statistically, the way that we're going to do this is we are going to add and subtract from our point estimate a particular computed value called the standard error. So when I say margin of error, I'm talking about the general concept of wiggle room, of error amounts. We, there are several ways that we can come up with a reasonable estimate of that margin of error, one of which is using the computed value called the standard error. So plus or minus the standard error, STD, multiplied by some confidence, confidence, um, I'm going to call this a confidence coefficient. Uh, or in other words, we can think of this, what the standard error is, is precisely mathematically is the standard deviation, standard deviation of that sampling distribution of the distribution of a whole bunch of draws of 30 samples, n equals 30, n equals 30. Again, so we are imagining if we kept doing this sampling over and over, we would have that sampling distribution. That distribution has itself a standard deviation. And we call that the standard, how much spread there is in the sampling distribution of a whole bunch of samples from our population would be the standard error. And because that is normally distributed, we can use the rules of a normal distribution to figure out how much of that distribution we want to, uh, or, uh, how many times we would want to expect to truly capture that population value. And so the common, uh, the common amount is two standard deviations on either side of the, of the center. Uh, in other words, 95%. So let's, let's look at what that entails on our tool. And this is where everything starts to congeal. You can feel, um, you can feel all the little neural networks in your head starting, starting to come together. So again, let's make a sampling distribution. Someone is ringing the shop. Um, so if I keep sampling, I get... A sampling distribution and notice this stack key tool is is used for teaching this very thing so what we're seeing here look at this the standard deviation of the whole population is 352 pages it's quite spread out look it's not very mound shaped but when I keep sampling from that and I pull 30 books from that population and then plot its mean I get a much more compact out, output of data because I'm averaging. These are each one of these is an average of 30 books. So look at my standard error. Is it larger or smaller than my true population error? Or sorry, just uh, spread. Smaller. Significantly smaller. And that's what makes. Uh, our ability to speak with a great deal of confidence about the true population mean um, 
the fact that these are normally distributed means that I can, as long as I'm willing to accept that sometimes I'm going to sample way out here, I can be pretty confident that most of my samples are quite close to the middle. Uh, and when I say quite close, this is where we get to be mathematical and say, well, let's be specific here. If I say I want, um, I want to be extremely sure, meaning how much wiggle room on either side would I need to allow for if I want 95 out of 100 of my samples to capture this true value? Notice that my um, my true population mean is right about here, right in the middle. So look what stat key allowed me to do is I can say, find me the page numbers above and below the mean, which chop my mound such that 95%, 0.95 of all of my samples are captured by the upper and the lower bound. That's what a confidence interval is. It is an lower and an upper bound of a sampling distribution of a whole bunch of samples that we believe capture 95% of the time the true population mean, mean meaning, <laughs> uh, meaning that the true population mean is somewhere in here. And look at this neat uh, um, graphic. I'm going to reset this because we're going to do it again. Um, look what I've got here on the right. This is a, uh, a horizontal bar in which my true population mean of 592 is shown as the dark bar. Now, when I do just one sample, my one sample, if I come back here, my one sample had a mean of 593.267. See that? So, and its two tailed sample or conference interval was um, computed to be, I can't, uh, I can't see them because it's scaled wrong. Uh, it would be 450 to a little over 700. In other <coughs> words, this range, this interval, did it capture the true population mean? Yes. And if I keep sampling, let's do another 10 times. Ah, look, experimentally, each one of these is a sampling mean. So each one of the, these uh, open circles is the middle of my 30 samples. How many of them included the true population value? Well, uh, 10 of 11, which is uh, a little bit less than we might expect. But uh, the law of large numbers says as we uh, increase the number of samples, we are we converge on that that limit of 95%. So if I did another 10 samples, I now have 20 samples and in this case my experimental data aligns with uh the prediction that if we increase the if we buffer our sample by two standard deviations above and below the mean of our sampling distribution approximately 95% of all samples we conduct will capture that center. Now, what's, uh, as that's settling in, uh, what is the unfortunate, or the, what is the reality facing us as statisticians? Not to be able to capture everything. Say it one more time, Steve. Yeah, I can be able to capture everything every time. That's true. Let's let's be a little more specific. We will not be able to capture the what? The mean. Yes. And unfortunately, because we're only doing one sample most of the time, unless we're trying to prove our methods, we we cannot say whether the sample that we just did was this one or the one that did not capture the mean. That's what we mean by 
stating with precision our error. There is uncertainty. The uncertainty is the true. The uncertainty is this middle bar. We don't know the true population value. We only can state with mathematical precision. Well, if we kept sampling and we did this a hundred more times, uh, I think only five of them would miss the true value. Okay. So uh, I, I really like this, this illustration because it shows us what we mean by 95% uh, confidence. 95% of these samples will grab or, or capture, uh, how does the book say it? It says um, success rate. The success rate of our sample, we would, we would predict to be 95% or whatever the accepted level of, of confidence is. Now here's uh, this is where I'm going to ask you to uh, type out in your chat box. So everyone, get your chat boxes ready. Um, I'm going to write the question, and we're all gonna we're gonna answer. So um, when Eric asks for the 99% confidence level. Will our error bars get longer or shorter around the point estimate of the population mean? So I want you to think about that for a second. So what I'm asking is, if I want to be reasonably sure that 99 out of 100 instead of 95 out of 100 of all of my samples will in fact include the population value. Are these bars going to get wider or narrower? Meaning how much more, am I going to have to add more error or less error around my bars? Oh, good. We already got a, dis a dispute, so I was hoping that we wouldn't get um, we wouldn't get uh, everyone saying the same thing. I should I should have had us wait and then all pressed enter at the same time. I'll do that next time. I'm sorry. We're learning. Do not do not be uh, do not be swayed by your quick answering peers. The thoughtful mouse always gets the cheese, or something. Uh, the patient cat gets the bird. Uh, we're having a, a, a crisis with my cat, and we're trying to keep Lou in as, as much as possible, but Lou is not very happy about this. More air, longer, 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 wider. Okay, so we're, we're, we're getting there. We have some, ooh, good, we have some dispute. So if we go up to 99%, Wider around the mean, yes. Are we gonna have to have a bigger buffer or a smaller buffer if we want to have more confidence in what? Confidence that the sampling interval captures the true mean. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try it. We have a, we have a consensus that it, they should be longer, uh, but not, uh, sorry, we do not have a consensus. We have the dominant view here we go, get ready. Hold on. They got wider. Because remember, we didn't change, we didn't resample. All we did was we took the standard error and we multiplied it by a larger number of standard deviations, meaning three. Three standard deviations approximately captures 99% of the values. So at the 99% confidence level, we 21 out of 21 of our samples of the population grabbed or included or enclosed the true population value. Um, so if so there's a trade off involved, if we are willing to accept <laughs> that only 80 ish percent of our samples capture the mean, we can speak with more precision, but less confidence. So let's, I'm going to write that in big words 
um, what the trade-off is here. Um, and then we'll have you tinker with your own data. Um, oh, well, this is going to be crazy because I, I always do this and I I get a little a little rambunctious with my resizing. Sorry, my computer is catching up. The problem is I have a 4,000 line file open and it's trying to resize it all at once. Uh, Uh, if we wish to speak about the population with more precision, meaning smaller confidence interval, we must accept a lower confidence rate, meaning fewer of, we would expect, fewer samples if repeated to capture the true population value. So this is the um, point estimate. This is the, uh, the sampling trade-off. If we speak about, if we wish to speak about the population mean with more precision, we must accept a lower confidence rate and this is our this is our fundamental um, interaction that I will invite you to explore with your library samples and uh, I will post in fact I'm going to put this on our analysis page right away oh no I blew up my screen and now I can't oh. If you can all make sure you have stat key open, because we're now going to start tinkering with, uh, with your experimental data. I, I can't pull that up right now. OK, so um, by the way, let me show you where that came from. I didn't want, I didn't want to steal the thunder uh, from I wanted, I wanted to selfishly be the one to show you that cool tool. It's on stat key, and then I did sampling distributions mean. So now because we don't know the true population value, we won't know whether your sample captured the true mean or not. So, but what we do need to do is estimate that standard error so that we can compute a conference interval. So on stat key, we want to click this, conference interval for single mean, median, and standard deviation. And by the way, I'm recording this, so I will post this um, probably by tomorrow evening. It takes about two hours for the system to process all this, so I can't do it right away. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to enter your book sampling. And I'm going to show you statistically how we can compute a standard error, even though we've only done one sample. And so I'm going to use, uh, I had a student last term who was actually a librarian for CCAC, and so I'm going to use his sample data, and he compared section JK with HG, and these are actual sampled page values, so it's real data. Um, let me figure out what JK is. He didn't put that here, JK. Uh, poli sci, U.S. poli sci. So, um, this is what you'll do when you have all of your pages or your other quantitative value is I'm going to grab all of my page numbers from the sampled books. He got us a sample of um, looks like an N of 35 here. And then I'm going to drop it into my stat key. So here I am in uh, edit data. And I'm going to put in all that data. And if I type the word pages at the top, that will give me a header row, in which case I will have this button checked. 
It's a single column of data, so I will uncheck that the first column is an identifier. And so even if you only have five numbers, you can still do this. It'll be a little bit uh, less accurate. So here I go. Here was my original sample, mean of 30, n of 35. I'm trying to estimate how long all the books in poli-sci for the US are. And my sampling mean is 338. Now, what, um, what we found experimentally is that, see, remember how I came here and I had my big population? Uh, what we found experimentally by actually testing this is it's not necessary to have all the population data. It gets pretty darn close if we do what's called a bootstrap sample, which is draw, we draw individual books from our sample with replacement, meaning we draw the book out of the shelf we record its value and then we put it back on the shelf so that it could be drawn, drawn again. And this is a tool designed to do this process from only 35 books. So here we go. I can draw um, a sample and our n is going to be the same amount. So obviously, or not obviously, our, uh, oh no, I drew, how many did I draw? I drew 35. And because it was drawn with replacement, my mean isn't exactly the same because some of those books could have been drawn twice. You can see from my sample, I sampled a little more heavily from this column of books. Um, and that's why we do this a whole bunch of times. So uh, in fact, you can do it hundreds of times. And we see the same phenomena. What is that phenomena with respect to the spread of the data? The spread of my sample was 161 pages. What's the spread of my sample of samples? Significantly less. Why is that? Because we're, we're resampling and so we're converging. You can imagine the, um, the rough proportion of values stays the same. So when we keep drawing, we will get a convergence around whatever that center was. So look, I now have a standard deviation of a sampling distribution. So again, standard error is the standard deviation of a whole bunch of samples of our sample. <laughs> okay, so we're two steps back, but statistically this is a very robust way of doing this. Um, and so now I can put on my normal distribution tails and say which cutoff values represent 90 or which cutoff values trap 95%, the center 95% of all of our samples. Well, that those cutoff values are 290 to 395. So now let's... Um, so this is what this is the conference interval. This would say that our point estimate of the average page length of books. I'm going to actually um, I'm going to screenshot some of this, and I'm actually going to post it on our analysis page with these statements. I'm sorry I'm doing this live. It's seven classes means I have to do some things as I go. Um, Okay, so I'm going to uh, write this out here in our um, in our analysis section. Oh, much better. Okay, so. I'm going to say oh my goodness none of these screens go down help help um, ah there's no way to win okay 
So what we've found here is uh, the 95% confidence interval is 290 pages. We would state it in a bound, so we'd say the confidence interval is 290 to 395 uh, around our point estimate of 339 pages. So in other words, what we're saying is we believe that if we repeatedly sampled all, what were we, JK? Yes. JK. Yes. If we repeatedly sampled the JK section, all sampled 30, 35 books from the JK section, we would expect about, again, this is, this is our way of stating an approximation specific, uh, with, with numerical precision, we would expect about 95 out of 100 of these samples to capture or include the true population parameter, um, i.e. the actual average page number, page number, average number of pages of all books with a LCCN prefix of JK. All right. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm, uh, I can put this image right here. And so um, take a moment and navigate back to your uh, library that document, analysis document I had you download. The second page is a set of questions. I'm just gonna finish plotting this up here. Oh no, I didn't put the picture. Um, And luckily, you'll have this nice uh, recording if you want to hear all this all over again. Um, so back here on the on this document, you'll do this for both. And so remember, this is this is nice because StatKey is going to help you. You don't have to. It'll give you. You enter your sample size and paste in your sample data. And I'm not asking you to become a spreadsheet whiz because StatKey is helping you figure out your quartiles, your max, and your sample standard deviation. So then I'm going to ask you to do 10,000 draws from your sample. So this is what gives us the standard error. And, and then the, the critical thing is I'm going to ask you to generate your three different levels of confidence and think about the width of that particular interval. So if we come back to the sample, um, let's let's keep going here uh, with our sample from Ben. So the ninety-five percent confidence interval is this, uh, and so let's let's compute the the width, meaning how how precise did a ninety-five percent confidence interval allow us to be? Uh, let's see. So if I come here and take, uh, oh, well, I don't have to do a math for that. That's 105. So we have 105 pages, um, conference interval. Uh, this is a width of 105 pages. Now, if I, I can change this conference interval by coming and saying, well, what are the bounds that would capture only 80% of our samples? And we learned that this we have less confidence 
that's going to enable us to have more what? Precision. Yep, so we can have a narrower band. Um, I have to phrase it as a fraction. So again, we don't have to go as far out on our normal distribution because we're willing to accept, as, as they say, fatter tails. And so uh, that means that they capture, uh, our band captures less of all of our expected samples, um, but our, our band is narrower. So then I can come here and say, in my second analysis paragraph, this is the kind of thing I'll ask you to reflect on this week. Um, if I'm willing to accept a lower confidence of 80%, uh, my interval is only 306 to 374 pages with a width of only 68 pages. So I'm more precise, but uh, we would expect um, 80 out of 100 repetitions of this same of this sample uh, to uh, include the true population value and then we could say unfortunately remember we we cannot know given our current sampling, um, our current experimental uh, structure, if our single sample does in fact capture the true, true mean. Uh, so uh, at, the, at the broadest level, our trade-off is, we only needed to look at 30 books which is quick, uh, but because we looked at only 30 books, there's, there's wiggle room, there's error, there's uncertainty involved. And so statistics at, in the broadest level is a mathematical endeavor to speak with precision about where does that error lie and how could we uh, accept more or less error? Uh, what would we have to do to get there? Uh, and so a couple of questions. I'm going to go back to showing me because I done. I think it'd be useful. Um, so back to this equation of x, our point estimate, add and subtract some amount of standard error. Where did I come up with two? That two is reflective of two standard deviations. Um, two standard deviations uh, around the mean. Uh, the precise value to capture exactly 95% of a perfect normal is 1.96. So sometimes you'll see that number uh, come up in stats books. They'll, they'll round, they won't round it to two uh, for a 95% conference interval. Um, why 95%? Uh, it's very interesting. There's a great deal of discussion among experts about why this uh, is, is the generally accepted 95% conference interval really getting us meaningful research results. Um, and uh, if, if you're interested there, I can get you links to a number of studies that suggest no. In fact, the 95% conference interval is a way for academics to more often than not uh, come up with values. Uh, this is associated with the notion of a, of a p-value very closely, which we'll, we'll get to uh, later. Um, I, didn't, I used to conflate them, and it was too much, and I've been encouraged to slow down. Um, the point is that one out of 20 failures, uh, many statisticians would say, is actually not acceptable in many real-life applications. Um, so, uh, for example, you can imagine uh, the application of this. I'm going to scoot over to another 
um, another board here and let me know if, if you can't see it. So um, since we're all staring at screens instead of each other because of the virus, let's, let's, be, um, let's, let's go into virus land. So um, if we came up with a magic serum uh, that would create immunity like, oh, a vaccine, um, and the application of that magic serum to humans is very sensitive in quantity. So if we want to, uh, what is the, what is the, uh, the optimal, uh, what is the optimal number of milliliters to administer to humans? And if we are, so we have to ask ourselves, what are the consequences of getting our estimate wrong? Um, so if we say, if we go too low, so too low, if we don't give people enough, we, uh, we don't get immunity, so no immunity. If it's too high, we get very sick people. We induce, we induce sickness in healthy people. Um, and so what do we do? We sample and we say, well, uh, we, we figured out what the optimal level is for 30 people. And it came out to be our, our, uh, our estimated middle came out to be uh, 2.65 milliliters. Uh, and so we have to decide, uh, unfortunately it's not the same for everybody. So we had to compute, we have to compute a conference interval based only on those 30 samples of how much the actual optimal amount was. If we imagine that we kept giving people little by little more and more until they got sick and then chopped that value in half and we figured out that's the optimal level for them. Um, are we willing to accept that? one out of 20 uh, individuals that we give the serum to is going to either think they're immune, but they're not, or get sick. Is anyone willing to accept a one out of 20? No. In the medical world, that's going to be way too high. Um, way, way too high. So the, uh, the point of this is that the conference interval that is acceptable will be specific to the domain in which you're working. Um, similarly, think about, um, uh, think about equipment testing for safety gear in your car. Um, well, you, you think about how much tolerance is acceptable on uh, brake parts. How many, uh, how many, how many brake pad sets are we willing to sell that we know might actually fail in, in use? Are we willing to accept one out of 20? Uh, obviously not. Um, so the conference level is domain dependent and will vary significantly uh, from domain to domain. The 95% is a general standard for doing and reporting research and is what you found in the sample articles that you got um, this week. But just realize the reason I'm having you compute the 80, the 95, and the 99 is because we want to develop an intuition such that as data analysts, we can discuss with those that are, uh, uh, if maybe we're the decision makers or working with or for, we can say, well, in order for us to have a more precise value uh, at the same level of confidence, what do we need to normally do? We have to up our, our uh, number of samples. Um, and so that is a trade-off because getting more samples takes more time and costs more money. Uh, and so... Those are some of the trade-offs that we'll be confronting here in our analysis. So I will, um, 
I'm going to pause it there and ask for uh, questions. Let me just walk you through one more time. Here's the document uh, that we want to uh, populate with, uh, with your experimental data. I'm going to have you skip the hypothesis testing stuff altogether because I am slowing down. Um, so what I posted here on our schedule, again, F5 is your friend. Um, so I said, note, skip the hypothesis testing questions and sections. Dedicate a few hours to carefully responding to the analysis questions, see our sample module and library sample. Upload all your work in our cloud drive linked in the module resources. So um, that's here. I will also extend. Um, so that's linked right here, shared drive for library upload. I'm also going to relink it on your homework section because there's no reason not to. Um, and I, I really encourage you to find some time to, to experiment and tinker and use the resources that I posted here um, because this is, the, this is a fundamental concept that I think many folks don't quite have a grasp of and, and the p-value which will come up next is very closely connected to this idea. Uh, where are you? Here. No. Here. No. There. Here it is. Okay, so now this on an F5 should be nice and complete. Okay, so there's your shared drive. Um, we'll ask you to upload your, so just jump right into spring 2020. I think I made, some of you may already have data in your folders. Um, go ahead and make yourself a folder or a directory. Um, so you wanna upload your analysis and then whatever raw data you have, go ahead and plop it right in there. Uh, that's a way that we can share our work. And then um, I also, these are the questions that I'd like you to reflect on. Um, so I gave you some instructions on how to do that updrive, prefix your files with your first name and the letters of your subsection. Um, so that will allow us to, uh, in the future, if people want to verify your work, they can easily find that. Um, and so what these questions are going to ask you to do is, compare the uh, conference intervals around uh, between your two different book samples. So um, I'll jump right back to my screen for one more second. Maybe more than a second. Sorry, I keep being fast and loose with my name. So the precursor to p-values is to say, well, if we ask uh, who's got two sections that they, who, which two sections are comparing? Who wants to be our sample person? Any takers? Lisa? Sorry, I was on mute. I had BL and KF. One was okay. like religion in the U.S. law. Religion and KF? Yes. Kangaroo Foxtrot. Uh, this is it was U.S. law. Law. So, uh, so Thomas will have a conference interval. So if we just let's make ourselves a uh, a coordinate plane, and so let's have zero pages, and um, I guess it's law books. So we can we'll go all the way up to like two thousand. So. He will have point estimates for both of his sections, the sample average. So he'll have an he'll have an x 
bar a sample average for the average page numbers of all religion books and maybe he'll have i would Ooh, religion is also long this is interesting um what's your intuition uh thomas of which one will be more higher average page count i was thinking the religion because it's going to be more theory based with books and then the law is more fact so i was thinking it would be shorter interesting yeah my, my gut is i think of all these law offices with these huge walls full of the yeah, books. books um so one of the things the analysis will ask you to do is if you work for a library that's trying to digitize its collection and you had to start with one section or another which one would save you more shelf space that would be a question for which the average size of the books would help you answer practically so he'll have a religion uh, point estimate and a law point estimate. And then around each of those, he'll have his error bars. And so we can imagine we can now, if we have two error bars from two different samples, we can start making deductions and the degree to which we can make certain kinds of claims. So one of the things that the analysis questions will have you do is visually represent your conference intervals. Um, so we can think of this as your conference interval. So maybe religion, do you have any point estimates yet, Thomas? Not yet, I, I didn't finish getting the data for law. So let's say this was 1,010 and this was 1,280. So he'll have a conference interval, say of 800, to uh, a, this would be like 1340, for example, and maybe this was a conference interval of 1020 to 1600. So because there's overlap, this is where the notion of a p-value comes in, which is how much overlap are we willing to accept between the conference intervals until we are willing to say something like law books are, are bigger, we should start with law. Uh, because remember how we, re we learned that the size of our interval will change based on how many samples we're willing to accept are wrong. So if the director of the library says, it would be egregious if someone found out that we were digitizing books that were in fact shorter uh, than religion uh, when we were supposed to be, we were directed by the president to start with the biggest books first. Um, this is a, a bit of a, it's not a truly trivial example because space is, is expensive. Um, how much error? So maybe so p-value is, is, is basically a quantification of how much overlap we're willing to accept before we say, okay, these are good findings. Um, and that value happens to be, guess what? 0 0.05, which is associated with the 95% conference interval, meaning if in standard academic research, you do a 95% conference interval on both of your estimates and they do not overlap, meaning there is no overlap. You go out and get a bottle of wine. Um, but when you read the American Statistical Association's critique of p-values, they say, this is ridiculous. To say that, to encourage for, uh, academics, uh, for them, for us to have this um, generally accepted rule that a, a result is not publishable unless they can meet the 0 0.05 threshold is, is grasping at straws for some quantifiable way to differentiate legitimate research from illegitimate research. And there are many academics today that would say that this is arbitrary and we're using it because it feels better to have something numerical to say this research is better than that research. Um, when in reality, we're dealing with a great deal of error 
and uncertainty. And academic crit uh, critiques of the current academic climate would say, we need to include p-value as a, one of many statistical assessments of data sets and not be uh, so fixated on whether or not conference intervals overlap. So don't, don't get overwhelmed by p-value because it's just a different, it's a way of expressing how much overlap between conference intervals is acceptable until for us to say that they are different or statistically significant differences. Um, so that's the overview of what you'll of ask you to work on this week. Um, compute your bars using StatKey uh, and then do a little, little write-up and upload that stuff online. Uh, questions? I'm going to lose, lose waiting to answer questions with this. Here's Lorena. <laughs> questions for Lou and I. Is the sampled variable, this is Connie. Yep. Um, is the sampled variable the um, total number of books in that section? Because mine, like the 27,852. The sampled variable is the, is the thing that you recorded about the book. So everyone recorded the variable of pages and then one other thing. So just the sample N is the like the 30. How many books by by section? Yep. That's the only other number. Okay. All right. Thank you. 